the three motives of faith in god from the living word by elwood worcester and theodore gustav fechner published in 1908 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the chief assumption i shall make in this discussion is as to the spiritual nature of god and i do not think that this assumption needs any defense or apology of the two forms of existence under which reality reveals itself to man spirit and matter religion has always sought for god within the domain of the spirit and has rejected with abhorrence the thought that god is a material object even fetishism does not adore the bare thing but the invisible potent presence supposed to lurk within that thing for religion the final word in this subject is the saying ascribed to jesus in the fourth gospel Quote, god is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth End quote. by god then i understand the one eternal all comprehending spirit within above or behind this universe our problem is not exactly how faith in such a being arose which would be a purely historical inquiry but how faith in such a being is justified how it acquires its power over the human mind and whether it is likely indefinitely to maintain itself in the face of the facts of modern life and knowledge in other words our problem is the roots and motives of faith in god faith we may define in the largest sense as the mind's acceptance of the truth and reality of those things which can neither be presented to the senses nor proved by logic in this large significance faith is one of the commonest things on earth it is incredible how many things are believed in the world but among these innumerable beliefs there is also a higher belief faith in the highest greatest last and deepest things faith in god and god's in providence faith in the soul and in its eternal destiny the higher and highest faith is not essentially different from other kinds of faith it only forms the apex of normal human belief without faith in many other things we should not come to faith in god i would next remind the reader that there is no inherent contradiction or quarrel between faith and knowledge but that one supplements and helps the other faith continually leading the way to new knowledge there are many things in this world which we imagine we know but which we only believe in fact outside the domain of mathematics and logic our knowledge is very limited and even these sciences are unable to prove their own first principles but are forced to appeal to an inner sense in man in which faith also appeals perhaps i can sum up their relation by saying that if all knowledge were withdrawn from faith nothing would remain but the grossest superstition and hardly the material for that while if all faith were withdrawn from knowledge we should possess little beyond the impressions of our senses and the void of mathematics therefore neither the man of faith nor the man of knowledge can afford to despise the other is faith then merely an imperfect form of knowledge 
which knowledge ultimately will supplant? In one sense, yes. Faith is always trying to convert itself into knowledge, and it is never so happy as when it gains the ground of observed fact and experience. St. Paul admits that, quote, now we see through a glass darkly, end quote, but looks forward to the time when we shall see, quote, face to face, end quote. In another sense, however, faith is a larger, a grander thing than knowledge, and it produces incalculably greater effects in the world and in the soul. Coming now to our subject, the strangest, the most significant fact in regard to man is his religion, his recognition of a power or powers which altogether escape his senses. It is this belief that has inspired his greatest discoveries, thoughts, and creations, that has united humanity as nothing else unites it, that has had more effect on human conduct and human progress than all his other knowledge and beliefs together. Unquestionably, the most important, persistent fact in regard to man is his religion. There is only one similar fact that we can point to, only one other persistent, invariable, incalculably fruitful belief in an unseen reality, and therefore only one safe point of departure, that is our belief in the invisible soul, our faith in an unseen spiritual principle in man. Our own soul we know if we may be said to know anything whatever, but it is the only soul we know in all the universe. I need not remind you how two persons may live side by side for years, each profoundly ignorant of the primary facts of the other's existence, or how the law may put forth its whole force, employ its keenest talents, set its vast machinery in motion in the vain effort to wring some secret from the human conscience. The soul of another man is beyond us. It is a world we may not enter. It lies before us in its baffling light, like gold buried beneath the waves. We are disposed toward the soul as we are disposed toward God. God and the soul belong together. He who believes in one believes in the other, and he who denies the one denies the other, and they belong together because they are at bottom one. Both are spiritual beings. We know our own soul, but the souls of other men we only believe in. We do not see them, we do not hear them, we cannot touch them. What we see and hear and touch is only bodies and however strong the analogy from ourselves, there is no law of logic that from the movements of bodies, from vibrations in the air, can prove souls. The solution to our problem then lies in this direction. If belief in the little soul is valid and justified, belief in the great soul, capital G, capital S, is also valid and justified. He who believes in invisible spirits and souls all around him, and in no great soul, capital G, capital S, above him, is superstitious. He who believes in thoughts and feelings, but in no mind in which these thoughts exist, is superstitious. It is necessary to believe more or not so much. If we can determine on what grounds and for what reasons we believe in the invisible, intangible souls of other men, we shall find that, on the same grounds and for the same reasons, we believe in the one all-embracing Spirit of God. All capitals. Following Fechner, I believe on the whole that other men have souls for three reasons and probably there is not a fourth. 
First, I believe in the soul because I have been taught to believe in it, because the whole world has believed in it before me, and still believes it all around me. This I call the traditional motive. Secondly, I believe that other men have souls because it is good and useful to believe it and dangerous to doubt it. If I refused to believe it and acting on my unbelief, I should treat other persons like lay figures or inanimate bodies. I should cut myself off from all human companionship from every avenue of spiritual life, and in a short time I should have to be sequestered as a dangerous lunatic. This is the practical motive. Thirdly, I believe in the souls of other men because on the whole it is reasonable to believe it and unreasonable to doubt it. This is the rational motive. I do not pretend that belief in the Spirit of God comes to us with the same overwhelming conviction as faith in the souls of our fellow men. As the object of our faith is higher, more remote, its motives operate less overwhelmingly, the analogy is less close, and there is more room for doubt. But in other respects nothing is changed. Faith in the infinite Spirit both capitalized, rests on the same ground as faith in the finite spirit, neither of which can ever present itself to our senses. Here we see both the motive of faith and the motive of unbelief. We renounce forever the attempt to make the invisible visible. We smile at the negations of those who deny God on the ground that they have let their eyes range over the visible heavens without seeing him. If God is here at all, he is here as the soul is in the body. As these motives are independent in their origin and action, and as one appeals more powerfully to one man or to one race, and another appeals to another, they cannot help coming into conflict. From this opposition arise the so-called warfare of religion and science, religious wars, controversies, strifes without end. In the course of these struggles, one motive or the other seems to be worsted, yet it quickly recovers and resumes its ancient sway over the minds of men. And out of these conflicts arise progress, new life, the religion of the future. The whole body and substance of human faith is the result of the combination and the opposition of these three motives. There is and remains a mighty resultant which is kept fresh and living by the movement and opposition of its component elements, just as the ocean is kept fresh and living by the action of its tides and currents. The abyss of human faith may be compared to the sea, a sea that is ever restless, ever apparently evaporating away, yet ever refilling itself. From it all rivers secretly draw their life, yet only to pour themselves again into its bosom. Here and there an atheist arises and says, quote, There is no God. End quote. That is, with the little dipper of his unbelief, he attempts to empty the sea of faith, which has existed from the beginning, and will continue to exist. The little dipper may dip until it is weary, but what it dips out runs through the air and the earth back to the sea. On the other hand, it is equally vain to attempt to reduce this complex of belief to one of its constituent motives. He who believes ever so firmly in the truth of his religion as a direct revelation from God must know how to extract practical good from his faith and to prove its reasonableness if he would benefit by it himself 
and recommend it to others. He who is in search of the best religion of all and finds it in the religion of love must always ask himself whether he would have found this religion if he had not found it in Christ. He who would build on reason and experience alone by observing free thinkers and materialists can easily satisfy himself how many of them by this principle alone have found faith in God and in eternal life. In other words, the action of the historic motive alone leads to dead traditionalism. The action of the practical motive to shallow utilitarianism and the action of the rational motive to weak rationalism. I call him a poor religious teacher who wishes to suspend all human faith from one of these threads, for it will snap, or who tries to make the tree grow from only one root which will not nourish it. And I call him a wise and useful religious teacher who helps to reconcile these great motives of faith and to bind them more closely together. In order to examine these motives separately, I am obliged to unwind them. But having done this, I shall take care to twist them together again. End of The Three Motives of Faith in God from the Living Word, published in 1908, by Elwood Worcester and Gustav Theodore Fechner.